Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast, where we interview remarkable people and share strategies for mastering money and living a meaningful life. With your host, Grant Sabatier, creator of Millennial Money and author of Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need. This episode is sponsored by BlockFi. BlockFi is an all-in-one digital wealth management solution for cryptocurrency investors. At BlockFi, you can invest in cryptocurrency as a way to diversify your investments and earn up to 8.6% APY on your crypto. Learn more and get a $25 crypto bonus for signing up at BlockFi.com grant. Again, that's B-L-O-C-K-F-I dot com slash grant to get a $25 crypto bonus. Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast. Last week's episode, Five Years After Fi, was by far the most downloaded episode in the Financial Freedom Podcast history. I received hundreds and hundreds of emails from listeners all over the world with specific questions related to the topics that I covered around money, investing, life. But one of the threads throughout all of the questions was, Grant, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned during your financial independence journey and in the five years after that would help me in my own journey? And that's a great question. And so I wanted to cover it in today's episode as a solo follow-up to talk more about five years after financial independence and share 15 of the lessons that would have made the biggest impact on my own financial independence journey and helped me reach financial independence more effectively, efficiently, and with a lot more enjoyment. And I also think they're going to be useful in helping prepare for what is likely to be an increasingly uncertain future. So we're going to dive into these 15. Some are controversial. You might have different thoughts. Hit me up over email or on Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So number one, let's dive in. Making more money is more important than cutting back more. This is a controversial topic, especially in personal finance, because so many personal finance books really for the past 30 years have been focused on saving more money. But there's really only a limit to money if you choose to make a limit, specifically around how much you make. And there's really not a limit to how much money you can make, but there is a limit to how much you can cut back before you feel like you're living in a cardboard box. And I experienced this firsthand when I was living in Chicago in 2011, just starting my financial independence journey. And I lived in a $700 a month apartment and drove a $700 a month car and never ate out And I always said no to my friends who were asking me to go out for drinks and hang out. There was definitely a deprivation mindset to my lifestyle because I was focusing on saving money above everything else. And I really cut back my expenses to the bare bones. And I was spending, you know, about $26,000 a year at that point, which is really not a lot of money living in a big city. And I probably could have even saved even more having a roommate or living further from downtown, but My commute to work was already about 35 or 40 minutes, and I didn't want to extend that even longer. But really, the thing that's had the biggest impact in my own journey and since becoming financially independent was the amount of money that I was able to make. And I never, once I started my financial independence journey, settled for a particular salary or bonus amount or even client fee without first thinking about how I could increase that amount. So, you know, we spend more time each year, you know, planning what we're going to watch on television and shopping online than we do, you know, optimizing our career and ultimately trying to make more money. And I can't think of anything that would have a bigger impact on likely anyone's life listening to this and certainly my life than going out and making extra money, whether it's in your full-time job or a side hustle Because there's really not a limit to the amount of money you can make. There's certainly trade-offs that are required, especially when you're first starting out and putting in extra time for your side hustles and extra time for your full-time business. And those really, that extra time, if you leverage it in the right way, can compound immensely over your life. And so I'm going to come out of the gate. The biggest lesson, making more money was significantly more important to me reaching financial independence quickly than cutting back because there's a limit to how much I could cut back. 
I really couldn't spend less than about $26,000. And even now I spend about $51,000, $52,000 a year. And there's not a whole lot of areas where I could cut back without hurting my level of happiness substantially. And so orienting your life so you can focus on making more money. It doesn't have to be forever, but especially while you're young, especially, I like to say, over the next five to seven years, because no matter where you're at today, no matter where you're starting from, the next five to seven years are the most important years in your financial life. Number two, do the life work first. Think about why you want more money. And this is something that I naively didn't think about when I was 24 and 25 and starting my financial independence journey. I just set the arbitrary goal of how can I save a million dollars and quote unquote retire as quickly as possible. But that was it. It was about a dollar number. It was about being able to retire early. It really had nothing to do with my life or what kind of life I wanted to live. Because at the age of 24, I didn't really know what made me happy. I was just miserable. I was anxious. I was depressed. I was broke. And so I just wanted to get as far away from that as possible. And so I was focused on the number and retiring early instead of focusing on the life. And I thought I wanted a lot of money, but throughout the journey, and certainly over the last five years, I realized that what I really wanted was more time, space, options, and freedom in my life. And while money can certainly buy you those things, you don't need a ton of money to have them. You know, I could have gotten all those things. And in fact, I had most of those things long before I'd even reached financial independence. And none of the freedom matters, as I often say, if you don't take advantage of it. Even after I had $100,000 saved, I had immense amounts of freedom in my life. And that was what I was probably the end of 2011, early 2012, when I had that amount of money. And I was still more stressed out about money. and was really stressed out about money the entire time until I'd saved $1.25 million. And looking back on it, I realized I wasted a lot of time being stressed when I didn't have to. And I was thinking all about money and not about life, certainly not quality of life. And so think about what you want your life to look like and then figure out how much that lifestyle costs. And that's one of the key chapters in financial freedom as I walk you through that. You know, figure out what actually makes you happy and realize that it might change as you change. So a lot of us don't know what makes us happy. I certainly didn't know what made me happy at 24 or 25, simply because I wasn't asking myself and I wasn't being honest with myself. And I realized that most of the things eventually that I found that made me happiest in life are relatively inexpensive or even free. And I've talked about those things many times on this podcast and on the blog. Things like playing board games with my wife, playing guitar with my friends, taking my dog for walks, riding my bike, riding, reading. Those cost very little, if any, money. Number three, live your own life. As much as I love my partner, she was never into my pursuit of financial independence. And no matter how excited I got about making, saving, and investing money, she just wasn't into it at all. Like, at all. It's not that she wasn't supportive, she just had no interest in talking about money, house hacking, any of it. And I'm cool with that. And we both respect each other and realize that we both have different interests. But I can certainly say, if my partner was on board, if she was on board the entire time, it likely would have made it a lot easier for me to reach financial independence. But I was able to do it, both because she respected me and gave me the space to do it, and in no way sabotaged my efforts. And now that we're five, she could actually really care less. She loves her job and has no plans to retire at all. And as I mentioned before, my biggest challenge in pursuing financial independence, it wasn't following the tactics. Those are pretty easy to understand, and if you listen to this podcast or you've read Financial Freedom, you get how to save, make, invest more money, all those tactical pieces. The tactics weren't the hard part. Once you get them, you know, personal finance is, you know, personal finance isn't rocket science by any means. The hardest thing was choosing to live differently than my family, my friends, my wife. And while it's certainly possible to reach financial independence solo, getting your partner on board, of course, is going to make it a lot easier. One quick tip to try to get them on board, focus on how money can help you live a life that you both want how you can achieve your life goals together through money. Lead with the life piece, then talk about the money second. Number four, find your limits. So growing up, we're often told that we can be or become anything that we want, especially the millennials listening to this. And while we're certainly capable of doing a lot in our life, we by no means can do or be everything. We all have natural limits in our life. 
But it's important to note that limits, they're not about inadequacies. They're about self-awareness. Knowing your limits is about deciding what trade-offs you're ultimately willing to make in your life. It's not about weakness. For example, I'll never be a billionaire. I've talked about this before. Why? The answer is pretty simple. I'm just not willing to manage multiple businesses, scale those businesses, or even work that hard. I also have no interest in becoming a billionaire. And the responsibility that comes with being a billionaire just isn't worth my time. I can't see how becoming a billionaire and making those trade-offs to try to make that happen would make my life more meaningful or happier in any way. And the sooner that you recognize your limits, the more successful and happier you're likely to become. This took me a long time to learn in my own life because I naturally thought that I could work harder than everyone and make a ton of money. And I didn't realize that there's the limit of 24 hours in a day. There's a limit to energy. There's a limit to physically what I can do, mentally what I can do, emotionally to what I could do. And those limits, they're not weaknesses, as I said. They're just trade-offs. And not everyone is meant to be a billionaire. Not everyone is meant to play in the NBA, but everyone deserves a life that they love. So find your limits in your life, figure out what sandbox you're playing in, and then be the best at those things that you're ultimately good at. And so finding the limits was hugely important in my own life, but it's something that I didn't realize that I had done until after reaching financial independence. Number five, find your weaknesses. This is different than finding your limits. When it comes to saving, making, and investing money, we're often our own worst enemies. Our little prehistoric brains, which scientists tell us that we only use 10 to 12% of, you know, they're not well equipped to handle the increasing complexities of the world that we live in, of the financial markets, of the population, of the internet. We're just not well suited to thrive in the increasing uncertainty of today's world. And I'm really confident that in the near future, I've talked with some technology companies that are developing a money AI, like a complete money AI, not like a robo-advisor that invests your money for you or an app that rounds up your purchases, a legit, complete, full money automation software that lives in your pockets and makes all of your money decisions for you. And so it identifies your weaknesses and then it fills those weaknesses and makes the statistically most sound decision for your financial life. Realistically, I don't think that will be released for probably the next three to five years, but it's certainly coming as technology continues to improve. But until then, figure out your own weaknesses, especially when it comes to money. You can just take a simple piece of paper and write them down. What are some of the stupidest decisions that you've made about money in the past six to 12 months? Why did you make those decisions? What were the triggers of those decisions meaning what happened before you made that decision. You know, one of the things that we all share is often a fear of our investments declining. And certainly this year with all the craziness in the markets and stocks going up and down, there can be a lot of emotion surrounding that. And so if you have a lot of emotion around that, try to get as far away from it as possible or double down and just build a better relationship with money. So some simple things that you can do or be honest with yourself and then try to plug those gaps of your weaknesses. So if you find yourself buying and selling stocks at stupid times, just delete the app on your phone. Stop checking it. Maybe only check stock prices once every two weeks or once a month because most of your money, as you know, should be focused on long-term investing, buy and hold investing, and you shouldn't be selling it or buying it even on a day-to-day basis. Number six, focus on your strengths. This also comes back to self-awareness. We often spend our time trying to turn our weaknesses into strengths instead of doubling down on our strengths. And we all have weaknesses. We've talked a little bit about that. But we also all have strengths. And this is the thing. The self-help industry, the education industry, so many industries are built around exploiting your weaknesses, making you feel like you are not enough as you already are. But we all have weaknesses. We all have strengths. But we spend way too much time, in my opinion, trying to fix our weaknesses rather than double down on our strengths. 
you know, once I realized that I was good at selling but terrible at managing people, then I just went out and hired someone to manage people for me. Focus on what you're good at and get even better at that thing. Fine-tune your strengths. That's where you should be putting most of your effort. And once I realized this, I started spending most of my time on selling, client management, and less of my time on those things that I didn't like. And, you know, this comes back when you look at a lot of successful people in business and a lot of, you know, happy people in life. They tend to focus on the things that they're really good at and not the things that they aren't. So there's only so much you can do. There's only so much time that you have. And that's why, you know, a lot of the successful CEOs out there recommend that you hire people who are smarter than you or who have complementary skill sets to you. So you're not going in and doing the same thing. Focus on what you're good at and then surround yourself with the people who are good at those things that you aren't. And that's one way to increase your chances of success. Number seven, invest simply early and often. You know, someone way smarter than me once said, successful investing is about time in the market, not timing the market. And over 90% of my own net worth has actually come from investment gains instead of money I simply made trading my time or even managing a business. It's been from being invested in the market and quote unquote making money when I sleep. But my investing strategy is very simple. I've talked about this a lot. Most of my money is in a total stock market index fund, which tracks most of the stocks in the United States stock market. And it's low cost and diversified and gives me a broad exposure to the U.S. stock market. Of course, I still have some individual holdings in companies, mostly tech stocks, as ultimately a way to hedge my portfolio and increase the chances that I can quote unquote beat the S&P 500. But I have you know now less than 20% of my net worth in individual stocks. And I actually recommend that you have less than 10% in individual stocks, especially as you're just getting started. So the key to investing is to come up with a simple strategy, as I've often talked about, and invest early, often, and as much as you can. And instead of waiting for the perfect time or the perfect investment even, just getting started and keeping at it. So if I would have waited two years to start investing, my net worth would likely be a million dollars less than it is today. And every time you buy stocks, hold it for at least two years. That's one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got. Hold it for at least two years. Whenever you're buying a company, don't think about selling it next week or next month. Think about holding it for two years at least. And don't even let yourself sell it. Because a lot of times, just the ups and downs of the day-to-day market, they're irrelevant to what happens over the long term. And so buy and hold your investments for at least two years. Don't buy or sell stocks when the market is open. It's another piece of advice I got that's great. So tend to, you know, we tend to have our app or watch the market go up and down and read the news and we get emotional and we end up selling when the stocks are down and locking in those losses or buying when stocks are high and not getting a good value. And it's always important to remember that we only lose or make money in a stock when we decide to sell it. If you keep the stock and it's gone down, that doesn't mean you have lost money because those gains haven't been realized. You haven't sold those assets. And put most of your money, as I said, in a broad total stock market index fund. Don't invest in anything you don't understand. And even alternative investments, things like investing in wine or art or commercial real estate, Those are things that you really shouldn't even consider investing in until you have at least $250,000 or are well on your way to financial independence. I see far too many people putting money in alternative asset classes right out the gate when they only have five or $10,000 to invest. They're way too risky. And so focus on stocks, bonds, real estates, and last but not least, building a business. Those are the ways to grow your money And ideally, you're doing all four of those. They're also the most historically reliable ways to build wealth. This doesn't mean that you can predict the future, but there's enough information, enough data, enough frameworks, enough great books written about those topics that building those four things, investing in those four things, is a much more predictable path to wealth than investing in other 
alternative assets. Number eight, good is good enough. This comes back to us being our own worst enemies. Don't overthink it. When it comes to money, the obvious answer is often obvious for a reason. This doesn't mean that just because everyone else is doing something, you should do it too. It just means a simple piece of advice like save as much money as you can. It's a good piece of advice. You should follow it. And I spent way too much time obsessing over every single minute detail, every single decision, every single number on my spreadsheet, worrying about my net worth. And I'd feel guilty for weeks when I made a mistake, whether I made a bad investment or went out and spent too much money. I wrote this post called A Return to Frugality because actually my third year, um, second year after reaching financial independence into my third year, I ended up spending four times more uh, the amount of money than I had planned to. And there were a lot of reasons for that. I spent a lot of money on a wedding. I spent a lot of money traveling. I'd spent so little money over the years that I was pursuing financial independence that a year after reaching it, I just went gangbusters. I just went all out and spent over $200,000 after spending you know, between fifty dollars and $60,000 throughout my entire financial independence journey. And I had to kind of rein it all back. And you know, I was pushing that upper threshold of trying to figure out whether spending more money would actually make me happier. And it really didn't. I mean, I did find things that I felt were worth spending money on eventually, but I had an immense amount of guilt and regret for spending that much money at the end of the year. And I worried too much about the future the entire time that I was pursuing financial independence. And you know, you know, if you're one of the spreadsheet tinkerers like I am when you're in full optimization mode, it's super hard to have a perspective. So, so much of being successful with money is really about simply coming up with a strategy, knowing the tactics, and then just grinding it out, executing on that strategy. And once you've figured out those tactics, you know, just really kind of keep with it. We all make mistakes. You've probably made a lot. I made a lot. But everything you're doing from good to bad, it really compounds over time. So as long as you're doing more good than bad, you tend to end up in a really good place. And simply moving in the right direction and keeping at it is often good enough. And so some of the things I did that just had the biggest impact were trying to save as much as I could, making sure to get that money invested as quickly as possible, investing in a tax efficient way, and just trying to side hustle and make more money so I could invest. And just doing that over and over again was what got me there. I mean, that's it. I mean, easier said than done by all means, but whether it takes you five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, those are the steps that work. It's not more complicated than that. And now a word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BlockFi. BlockFi is an all-in-one digital wealth management solution for cryptocurrency investors. At BlockFi, you can invest in cryptocurrency as a way to diversify your investments and earn more than you would at a bank. They offer a no-hidden-fee BlockFi interest account with an annual return of up to 8.6% APY. You're probably wondering how such a high return is possible. The way it works is simple. BlockFi makes its money by lending your crypto to institutional clients like banks and investment companies. Because they are lending your crypto at a high interest rate, they can then pass along that high interest rate to you. It currently works with Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, or Stablecoin. They are committed to trust and transparency and have big name investors that include university endowments. As the industry leader in crypto investing, BlockFi is easy to use, has no minimums, and no lockup periods. If you're looking to buy crypto or earn a high rate of interest on your crypto, you should definitely check them out. For a limited time, you can earn a bonus of $25 in crypto when you open a new account. Just go to BlockFi.com grant to get started. Again, that's B-L-O-C-K-F-I dot com slash grant to get a $25 crypto bonus. Number nine, it takes time. Everything in life takes time. Most side hustles, you don't start making money for six to 12 months. Most investments, they take years to start growing in a meaningful way. A lot of people think that it's going to be quick and they focus on getting rich quick. And then that ends up completely derailing them. And they just spend their life trying to get rich quick. And then when they make a little money, they spend it all. And then they try to get rich quick again. 
you know, we've all heard those stories of famous people who became a millionaire and then went broke and then became a millionaire again and then went broke. And money is not that complicated, but it does take time. And simply, often the most successful people are the ones who are the last ones standing. And so, and this comes down to anything in life, anyone who starts a blog or a podcast or wants to write a book or create a company, so many people give up way too soon. And if you are not willing to do something for at least six months to a year, whether it's anything that you're going to spend your time on, I would likely encourage you just not to do it. And of course, that's a huge overgeneralization. And you have to think about how that applies to your own life. But if you're not willing to put in the time, not just the day to day time, but stick with something for six months to a year, or in the case of investing, a lot longer, then you need to question why, or maybe not start that business or that podcast or that blog. Blogging is one of those great examples where I started Millennial Money in 2015. And I would say over 95% of the bloggers that I started with that were my friends at that time, now no longer blog, it might even be higher than that. But of that 5% that have stuck with it, every single one of them is successful. Every single one of them is making money from their blogs. Some are making a lot of money from their blogs and it makes their life richer. So those ones who stuck with it, who are willing to put in the time, they're the last ones standing and they've become successful because of it. Another piece of this around it takes time is just because it took me five years to reach financial independence, it doesn't mean that you should try to do it too. And I actually would have taken a much slower pace as I've talked about in some interviews before and not made so many extreme trade-offs in my own life. So go at your own pace, adapt, focus on maximizing your happiness per dollar, both in how you spend, but also in how you save money too. You might be spending too much. You also might be saving too much. I met a few people on my book tour who confided in me that they couldn't sleep at night because they were saving too much money. Saving too much was actually stressing them out. And to me, there's really no such thing as balance in life. It's really all about the ebb and the flow the rhythms, the changing of the seasons, what trade-offs are you willing to make today, which ones aren't you willing to make tomorrow, and then letting that ultimately be the guide of using money to create happiness, space, and freedom in your life. I think balance is a myth. Number 10, money has diminishing returns. So I've said this before, but the more money that you make, save, and have invested, eventually the less money actually matters to you in your life. This is one of the most surprising lessons that I learned after reaching financial independence. I spent all this time learning how to make and save money, all this time building the skills, building businesses, creating income streams, investing. And then once I reached financial independence, I was still really, really focused on money. But once I was well above my financial independence number, money just really had diminishing returns. It's not something, unless I'm writing about it or teaching about it, that I think a whole lot about. And that's something I didn't expect. And I talked about this a little in the book that simply having the ability to buy something eventually became enough. And as I tend to find, the more time that you spend with your money, the more honest you are with yourself about what makes you happy in your life, the better your relationship with money becomes. Number 11, give yourself permission to do nothing. So this is one of those huge lessons that I learned after reaching financial independence that I wish I would have known while pursuing it. Set a time on your calendar each week to do nothing. I typically recommend three to four hours. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing or very little. This isn't just going out and playing your guitar or reading a book. Go out and lay in a hammock and look at the sky. Lay under the trees, which is my personal favorite. Take a walk but focus on being present in the world around you. Focus on letting your mind wander. You can also meditate if you like. Just exist in the world. Creating this space in your life, on your calendar each week to fill your time with doing nothing and not having to worry about being productive or, you know, I used to always fill every moment of my day with 
meetings, you know, 15 minute meeting after 15 minute meeting. And then I'd feel guilty when I wasn't working. So when I just wanted to chill out, when I just wanted to hang out or even read a book, I'd feel guilty that I wasn't working, that I wasn't working on my side hustle. And so schedule time to do nothing. This helped me immensely in my own life. Number 12, health should be the priority, not the afterthought. You know, if you've listened to this podcast or read my work, I've always struggled with self-care. It's something that I've always struggled with in my life. It's just really hard for me to achieve. I just said that I don't believe in balance, but to achieve that ebb and flow, to work out consistently and eat well consistently and not work all the time. That's something that I naturally struggle with in my own life. It's one of my Achilles heel, and it's something that I've struggled with my entire life. And I'm certainly getting better at it in my mid-30s, but the only reason I'm getting better at it now is because I'm more mindful of it, and I'm also a lot less stressed than I was back then when I was pursuing financial independence. So, you know, like a lot of people who are in their 20s, I thought that I was invincible, that I could work 80-hour weeks forever, but it's not good for anyone, not even if you're in your mid-20s. And I know that I was my own worst enemy, and now that I'm 35, I realize that I still have the same amount of energy in a lot of ways, but I'm able to contain it and use it much more effectively than just going all out all the time. And I should have definitely been working smarter. This is something that I learned with time and I likely would have been way more effective in my businesses, way more effective with my investments if I wasn't just grinding all the time. So focus on your health. Everyone knows health is wealth. That's something that I knew was important, but have and continue to struggle with it in some ways, in my own life, but I feel grateful that I'm naturally doing better now. Number 13, ask for help. When you have a question about money, ask someone who actually knows. So don't just search online. While of course I recommend reading blogs and listening to podcasts and reading books, there's really no substitute for when you have a very, very specific question about your life or about a problem or a struggle that you're having to reach out to a specific, you know particular expert in that topic and paying someone for an hour of their time even if they're expensive can pay back an immense dividends in terms of how much money you can save or make or being more tax efficient and so a good lawyer a CPA a realtor are all worth paying for even a financial advisor which in financial freedom I talk a lot about how you can manage your own money and you should know how to manage your own money But if you have a very specific financial question and you don't have a friend who can answer you or the Reddit forum can't help you or a Facebook group can't help you, a financial advisor, especially one that you pay by the hour, is a great person to consult with. Just make sure you're not compensating them based on your investments or a percentage of your investments. But there are now more pay per hour CFP advisors than ever before. And so if you have a question, reaching out to them and getting that very specific question answered is more than worth it. The first three and a half years of my financial independence journey, I often had questions, but felt too proud to reach out to others to ask them. And I should have just swallowed my pride and reached out and asked them. And once I started to, it really accelerated my journey to financial independence. I was doing my taxes wrong. I was investing in a way that wasn't tax efficient. I, with clients, didn't have the legal contracts locked up like I should. And so if I would have done that earlier, I would have saved money. And I'm glad that I actually started. So ask for help, pay for help when you need it on a case-by-case basis and make sure you're always paying by hour. It's a huge, huge lesson that I learned. Number 14, share everything that you know. So a lot of us, especially when it comes to money, we tend to focus on our own finances. We might listen to blogs or listen to podcasts or read blogs, but we don't share what we know or the journey that we're going through. And the size and the scale at which you do this depends on you and, of course, how much time you want to put into it and where you're at in your life. Maybe it's as simple as talking to your partner about it. Maybe it's as simple as talking to your friends This is one of the things that I always encourage is having a couple friends, whether it's online or in person, who are into the same things you're into, whether it's financial independence or personal finance or investing or side hustling, having some people in your life that you can talk about these things, a couple people 
almost like a support group or a friendship group or an accountability group, those can pay immense dividends in your life. But sharing everything that you know with your friends about money, sharing resources, and even taking that to a larger scale. So whether it's a blog or a YouTube channel or a podcast or um, you know just writing on Medium or sharing on social media, getting out and sharing what you know helps you connect with others who are also not only interested in the same topics, but could help you on your own journey. And I found this aspect to be really the X factor in my life. Once I started sharing about money, the things that I had learned, readers started showing up on my blog who not only wanted to learn from what I had done, but also wanted to share what they had done. And I learned some incredible strategies, some incredible mindset, mindset shifting strategies from readers who helped me think about things you know, in a different way. And so writing and sharing you know, also helps me organize my own thoughts and reflect on my own life and what did and didn't work. And many readers and podcast listeners, they've turned me on to books and ideas and connected me with incredible people who I can now count my friends. And that all started five years ago, uh, five years and a couple months ago when I launched Millennial Money and just started getting out there and sharing the things that I was interested in. And so you can not only connect with others who are on a similar journey, but it can also deepen your relationship with yourself. And you can also maybe monetize that content as well. And so I get a lot of emails from people interested in starting you know, personal finance blogs and creating content around personal finance because they're interested in the topic and I always encourage them to do so. And it's one area where creating content, if that's something that you want to do, there's so many ways to monetize it now. You know, And as long as it feels authentic to you and you feel like you're adding real value and you feel like you have something to say, then I encourage you to share everything that you know. Lesson number 15, don't be afraid to let go and recalibrate. You know, for me, the skills that helped me reach financial independence aren't the same ones that have helped me cultivate a happier life after it. And so one of the things I worked so hard, I was so intense, I was so cutthroat, those are skills that don't help you enjoy life after you reach financial independence. After reaching financial independence, I really had to learn how to let go. And what I mean by that is... I viewed myself as this kind of young, fast moving, creative person who, you know, could always solve a problem online to needing to let go of that and create some space for the me that I had yet to become. And what I mean by that is I really wanted to be a writer my entire life, but I wasn't writing at all really while I was pursuing financial independence. And so I had to create space for that. And start thinking of myself as a writer and start creating. And what does it mean to be a writer? It means to just write. And so instead of talking about wanting to be a writer, the only way to be a writer was to actually write. And so to start doing those things that I wanted to do and that I wanted to become, the only way to do it was to actually do it. And so creating enough space in your life for those things that you don't yet know exist and those people that you haven't yet met, you got to have space for them. If you're always just busy, if you're always doing the same thing. And hands down, the most successful and happiest people that I've ever met in my life are all good at one thing, and that's embracing and adapting to change. And finally, the bonus, I've said this before, I'll say it again, can't say it enough times, define success for yourself. And this is a lot easier said than done. It's something I had to spend many years thinking about because it's easier to say that, define success for yourself. Don't just define it as having a big house and many cars. And maybe that is how you define it. And that's cool too. But think about what it actually means to you. You know, even though your parents brought you into this world, we're all going to leave it alone. We have such a limited time here. We don't know how long we have here. It's our one life. It's our one shot. We want to make the most of it. Everyone deserves to be happy. And I finally realized that after chasing all the money, It wasn't about the money at all. It was about having more peace in my life. It wasn't even about security. It was about growing. And it also wasn't even about being happy, but about feeling alive. So these are the 15 plus a bonus lesson, biggest lessons that I learned during the time that I was pursuing financial independence and in the five years after. The things that I wish I would have known when I was on my financial independence journey 
And so I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's been great spending some time with you. Thank you again for all the emails, all the listeners around the world. It means a lot to me that you tuned in. And I hope you have a good week. I'll see you soon.